Okay, welcome to a very rainy Congressional Cemetery. Um, it just suddenly uh, popped up here. Uh, the weather looked better earlier, but um, I'm uh, told by my weather app that this will clear up shortly. Um, in fact, it seems to be slackening already. So we're going to start here on the porch, uh, where you get a sense of the uh, size of the cemetery here. And, um, and uh, then we will move on uh, to, the, uh, to the actual uh, gravestones in just a few minutes. Um, I want to talk today about sort of my specialty, which is um, urban legends and scandals and maybe a little ghost story here or there. These stories that we tell ourselves. Um, and uh, it's very different from the history as written down in, uh, in history books. Sometimes these legends become history, um, and uh, and so there's sort of a constant fight against the 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 sort of the fake stories becoming the real stories. There's a bunch of stories related to various people that are buried here in Congressional Cemetery, um, and so those are the stories I want to tell today. Um, the first one I'm going to talk about because like this is the one that um, seems appropriate today. I wasn't really going to talk about it, but uh, it does seem appropriate today, is about how D.C. was built on a swamp. Hi, Tim. Um, and uh, that's the story. It's, it's, it's a great metaphor, right? And it kind of um, works well in the whole, like, why do we tell these stories? Well, because they tend to have good morals. And so in this case, the, uh, the, the D.C. is built on a swamp. The swamp, uh, that is the federal government, et cetera, et cetera. The thing is that actually, uh, D.C. looked very much like Congressional Cemetery did today. If you look behind me, you can see that there's kind of rolling hills that, uh, that cover the whole cemetery. Um, and this is what D.C. looked like. It doesn't look like this today because we have actually graded much of the city. Um, there are certain uh, streets where you can actually tell that the, that the houses are built many feet above the street level because they graded the street houses had already been built and so they just kind of left them high and dry but this is really what dc looked like now to be entirely honest um there were low-lying bits of congressional cemetery that did tend to get flooded on days like this or maybe even had a uh a spring feeding them which did make for a slightly swampy uh parts and so actually some parts of congressional cemetery are sort of known for uh, being easily flooded, um, otherwise uh, less desirable. They have been filled in, uh, but it's, it's never quite the same as when you start with a, uh, a nice high piece of ground, like right behind us here. So anyway, but if you want to get a sense of what DC looked like before the city was built here, Congressional Cemetery is a great place to come and get kind of the unfiltered version. The only thing that you're going to have to sort of add for yourself is that this would have all been covered with trees. Probably not the beautiful big trees that you see here, slightly smaller, uh, but uh, completely covering it. So not quite a forest, but just kind of, uh, just kind of a, a low level trees. All right. Um, you know what, I actually see blue sky coming this way. It's still raining, but the rain is slackening, so we're going to head out, um, go to my, uh, one of my favorite people here in the cemetery, John Quincy Adams. Now, you're probably saying right now, wait, hey, John Quincy Adams, he's not buried here. He's buried in Quincy, Massachusetts. How did that happen? To really explain that, you have to go back to the history of Congressional Cemetery. Um, so, after 1800, after the federal government moved here, people started to move onto Capitol Hill. Before that, you had a lot of people sort of clustered around the, uh, the Capitol, people that were actually working on building that and maybe a little bit around the Navy Yard, but really as of 1807, Capitol Hill started to, uh, to evolve. Uh, one of the uh, things that needed to happen uh, was to build churches. Um, we needed amenities here. And uh, so a group of people, of Episcopal people that had started a church um, down New Jersey Avenue in an old tobacco barn decided that, hey, they wanted to build a church. Um, that's Christ Church on G Street, about a mile west of here. Now. 
they also realize that if you're going to have a um, if you're going to have a church, you're going to need a place to bury the uh, uh, members of that congregation. They didn't want to do sort of the British version of uh, just clustering them around the uh, uh, around the church. So instead, um, they looked around and they saw a mile east uh, a mile east of where they were, open land. Now this was really I mean this was the end of the world back then, and um, and so they. Um, they said, "Hey, this is this is good. We'll buy some of this." They paid three hundred dollars to uh, to buy up uh, four and a half acres, right? Um, to uh, as a as a new cemetery. Um, the idea being that they would uh, pay that back, pay themselves back the three hundred dollars by selling uh, grave sites for a dollar a throw. Once they'd sold three hundred graves, they would turn over the land to the church. Um, so, uh, almost immediately after that, um, uh, one of the Congress members died, a guy named Uriah Tracy, and uh, the question was, well, where do we bury him? Back then, you had to take people, you had to bury people quickly. You couldn't take them back home like you would do today. Um, uh, and so, uh, at that time, if somebody died here in Washington, they would be taken over to Georgetown, to some of the cemeteries over near Georgetown. But, as anybody can tell you who's tried to get from here to Georgetown during rush hour, it's a pain to get over there. So, when this cemetery opened here, it was like, hey, that's perfect. Let's bury some people here. Let's bury the Congress mem here, members here. And we're two miles from the Capitol, so it's kind of perfect. Anyway, and that's exactly what they did. And um, so, uh, then they actually went a little bit further and they said, you know what, we should have a special marker for these Congress members who die while in office, while here in Washington, D.C. And so they had a guy named Benjamin Latrobe, who's known for being uh, the architect of the Capitol, the guy that actually built the Capitol, we'll get to the architect part in a minute, uh, design these cenotaphs. And there we also get our first scandal, because people were not happy about the shape of these, or some people weren't. Um, in fact, a uh, senator from Massachusetts um, st stated that these uh, cenotaphs add a further horror to death. And, uh, and so clearly he was not a fan. Nonetheless, they kept going with that. And, uh, and so um, in 1848, when John Quincy Adams, who's the only president that ever after his uh, time as president returned to the House of Representatives, uh, he died in the Capitol. Um, and so he uh, was given a uh, cenotaph here because by then it was easier, much easier to take people home. Um, and in fact, they, he wanted to be buried in Quincy, Massachusetts. And um, so uh, that's exactly what they planned to do. Um, however, this idea of marking the passing of Congress members had remained. So even though he's not buried here, he still gets the cenotaph. Now, John Quincy Adams is one of my favorite characters uh, of American history, um, and there's great stories about him. In fact, I'll be telling a number of those as we go around. Um, but um, I want to start with uh, one of my favorite urban legends related to him. Now, if you've ever taken a tour of the Capitol, uh, once they get to, uh, well, what's today, Statuary Hall, which has been in the news of late, you get to Statuary Hall, the tour guide will put you in one part of the, uh, of, of the hall there, stand in another and whisper, and you can actually hear them, even though you are many feet away from them. Um, it's an oddity of the shape of the roof. Now, the story grew up that uh, Adams had, in fact, used that to spy on his political opponents while he was there. And I love the story. It's like you have this guy who's really pretty old, right? He's, he was 79 when he died. Um, and so the, 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 the clever aged dude stealing a march on his young vigorous colleagues by appearing to be asleep but actually listening in on them. Problem with this story is that this sort of whispering gallery of uh, that, uh, that hall didn't get noticed until after 1900 when they had rebuilt the whole roof. So in Adams' time, um, the, it was known that the acoustics were terrible in there, but there was none of this, there was no ability to actually listen in on your opponents. Kind of unfortunate, as I said. I, I love the story, I love the idea uh, that it portrays, but um, it's, it's unfortunately not true. Anyway, um, uh, so we're gonna head around the corner. Wanna go that way? I'll, I'll just meet you over at the public vault. Um, 
uh, the I'm heading through the uh, gravestones right now over to the place where actually John Quincy Adams did spend some time here in Congressional Cemetery. In fact, he's one of three presidents that, uh, that spent some time uh, here in Congressional Cemetery. Um, he, uh, uh, not very long, I mean, Adams I think was here for about a week, um, but uh, uh, William Henry Harrison was here as well. Uh, interestingly enough, he spent more time in the public vault than he did in the White House. Um, probably the most interesting person, though, to have spent some time here is Dolly Madison. Um, actually, it's quite sad, the reason for this. When uh, she uh, died, uh, her son, her ne'er-do-well son, had spent all of her money. And so she was broke. Um, her estate had no money to bury her, to take her home. So she was actually put in the public vault. Uh, anybody could actually do that. You had to pay a certain amount per day to, to be allowed to stay there. Eventually, she was actually moved to one of the other vaults here, a private vault, uh, where she spent some time uh, before finally uh, being laid to rest next to her husband. Um, so the public vault um, was kind of the focus of the um, of the or the end point of a funeral procession done for John Quincy Adams after his death, and therein lies another tale because one of the people that was in office at the time when Adams died was none other than Abraham Lincoln. He served one term as the uh, representative from uh, Illinois, and uh, and and during that time was when uh, Adams died. Um, and in fact, if you look at the uh, order of the procession from the Capitol to here, you will see uh, Lincoln along with 40 others uh, members of the House of Representatives listed as one of those of the organizing committee. And so the, 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 the story sort of continues to grow that, that Lincoln was partly responsible for this, um, for this uh, helping organized this funeral procession, helping organize the funeral of John Quincy Adams, which again, this kind of idea that a, um, that it, presidents from two very different eras uh, coming together in this manner. So it's just like that picture that you see of uh, Bill Clinton shaking JFK's hand. It's like, wait, those are, you know, you feel those are two completely separate eras, but yet there are these connections. So it's, it's, it's this great little uh, vignette into the life of Lincoln. Unfortunately, uh, again, it's not quite true. Uh, what actually happened is that they, uh, that the Speaker of the House was supposed to set up a, um, a, uh, a subset of representatives that would accompany um, Adam's body back to Quincy. Um, and, uh, but they kind of, something got uh, mistaken there, and they were also given the job of organizing the funeral. Now, 40 people to organize a funeral is way too much. And so when they got together, like, okay, this is silly, we're not going to do this, we're going to pick a, a subset of, um, of people to do that, and everyone else can go about their business. And then the second thing was that when it did come actually to accompany him back to Quincy, uh, Lincoln was swapped out. Now, Lincoln was the only Whig uh, in the Illinois uh, delegation at the time, so it kind of made sense that, that he would have been uh, delegated to this, but there were uh, non-Whigs who were, had served much longer with Adams who made more sense to, as, uh, uh, to be along for that final journey. Anyway, so um, Lincoln actually had to write a letter about you know, a month after this all happened to say, no, 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 I wasn't really part of this. Nonetheless, even today, you're going to see uh, people that say, oh, yes, Lincoln was one of the organizers of Adams' funeral. Um, so it's, it's, it just goes to show it's, it's tough to keep a story that once it's gotten out, it's very tough to get a story uh, uh, to be dislodged from the uh, public memory. All right, we're going to head this way. And, uh, and Brian Ketchum wants to know, how do we know we're getting true stories and not urban legends? Brian, uh, Brian asks me from uh, Texas whether we're actually getting the truth here or not. And I'm going to just say, you've, I've given you tours, Brian. You know that you can trust me on this. This is, uh, uh, this is stuff that I've deeply researched and I've, uh, I've enjoyed uh, getting to the bottom of things. And I will be happy to argue about any of these with you over a beer sometime. All right. Um, now, one thing that's fun about Congressional Cemetery, and I do a lot of research on uh, people that lived 
uh, or operated on Capitol Hill over the years. And um, very, very often they end up here in Congressional Cemetery. Um, so I've always been a big fan of, uh, of the cemetery. Um, and uh, one of the reasons why I enjoy giving these tours is that kind of my chance to sort of say thank you for all of the work that they have done over the years here to, uh, to uh, make sure that I can find this information. Um, and so there's a couple of the um, of people buried here that are particularly um, sort of local, like they were born here, they grew up here, they returned here after they died, sort of the, you know, the, the, the favorite sons, well, or in this case, the least favorite son. Um, so uh, we're standing here on the Harold family plot. Now, uh, Harold, uh, the, the elder Harold here, was actually worked at uh, the Navy Yard, which a lot of people um, here at Congressional Cemetery did. Remember, the Navy Yard is just a, uh, a mile down the Potomac, I mean, Eastern Branch from here, excuse me, Anacostia River. Anacostia River from here, um, and so it's not too surprising that there would be a lot of connections between uh, the, the Navy Yard and here. So, Mr. Harold here is uh, it works as uh, a well-known worker at the Navy Yard. His son, David Harold, a little less um, salubrious. Uh, Harold, uh, the younger Harold was, well, it's interesting, there's kind of multiple stories about what he was like. And uh, to be honest, I don't know, uh, I, and I'm not sure that one will be able to determine what, what he really was like. So on the one hand, there's people that say that he was kind of ne'er-do-well and uh, easily led and, you know, kind of out of it. But he was also a pharmacist assistant, which kind of says that he couldn't have been entirely stupid either. One thing that is certainly true is that he fell in with a guy named John Wilkes Booth. And uh, when Booth um, started his, um, his uh, conspiracy to, first of all, to, um, to uh, kidnap uh, Abraham Lincoln and later switch that to killing him, um, David Harold went along with that. Uh, Harold was actually, uh, that evening, was not with uh, Booth during the actual assassination. He was helping another member of the conspiracy, but they did meet together uh, south of here after the assassination. David Harold was with Booth when they were surrounded in the barn down in southern Virginia. Um, he surrendered. Booth was captured or was killed. Um, but uh, Harold was brought back to the arsenal, again, a little bit further down uh, the, uh, the Anacostia from here, um, where he and the other conspirators were uh, put to death after a trial, of course. But um, I think the conclusion of that was pretty much foregone. Anyway, um, he was actually buried at the arsenal, and the, um, the, the U.S. government wanted nothing further to do with him. They certainly didn't want him. Um, known where he was. They actually went through great um, lengths to try to uh, make people think that they just thrown Booth's body into the, uh, into the river here. Um, but Booth, like uh, Harold, was buried at the arsenal. A few years later, the Harold family requested the body back. Now, at that time, the arsenal was being rebuilt multiple times. They'd actually had to move the body, I think twice by then. Um, so they were perfectly happy to give up the, um, the body. Um, the only thing that they did say, though, was that there, there was not going to be a uh, grave marker on Harold's uh, grave. And so there isn't. Um, you can see the rest of the Harold family here, including his sister over here. And I believe that, uh, that he's actually buried on top of her, but we don't really fully know that. Um, either way, there is no marker. In fact, there used to be one of those little markers where it would be, hey, learn more about this, call this number. But even that's been removed. So really, the, the, the only way to know where David Harold is buried is to ask a tour guide. All right, we're going to head over uh, to this way. Um, to one of my favorite uh, guys here, um, uh, and again, it's not because of any uh, great shakes he was as a person. Yeah, he had, he had his moments, but um, it, it certainly is, it's more uh, what he got wrong is much more interesting than what he got right. Um, this is William Thornton, who is, of course, best known for being the architect of the Capitol. He is the one that designed the, well, the exterior of the Capitol. Um, Latrobe, who I mentioned earlier, uh, entirely redid the interior, and thankfully, because um, Thornton wasn't actually an architect. 
he was a uh, doctor. Um, and so often when people talk about him, they're like, oh yeah, you know, like for, for, a, for a doctor, he was a pretty good architect. The problem is that for an architect, he wasn't a terribly good doctor either, or something like that. Um, so, William Thornton right here, he's the only one, actually, that gets one of these Senate halves. Um, so he was not a member of Congress, but he did, does get a Senate half like the, the Congress uh, people because of his connection to the Capitol. Now, Thornton um, met George Washington while he was designing the Capitol, when the, while the Capitol was being built. And so when he heard that uh, in 1799 that uh, George Washington was sick, he went down to Mount Vernon uh, to, uh, to check on his, on his friend there um, and, uh, you know, do what he could as a doctor, I guess. Um, but as, as I mentioned earlier, with getting over to Georgetown, well, it was no easier to get down to, uh, down to Mount Vernon. By the time he gets to Mount Vernon, George Washington has died. No problem, says uh, uh, Dr. Thornton. Give me a couple of pints of lamb's blood and some hot water bottles, and I'll get this guy going again. Um, Martha Washington says, uh, no thanks. Um, and that's the end of it. Now, this, again, kind of sounds like an urban legend, right? This is the kind of thing that if I were trying to make William Thornton look bad, this is exactly the sort of story I would tell. Uh, I mean, yes, that people had thought back in the day that a little bit of lamb's blood that you could actually revive people, but let's face it, nobody, I don't know if anybody tried it, but it certainly had never worked. So, um, so the idea that he would sort of blithely said, oh yeah, yeah, the George Washington, I can get him going again, is really kind of ridiculous. It makes him look bad, right? Well, the reason why I know this story is because he actually wrote a letter later in his life basically complaining about that darn Martha Washington. If she had just listened to me back then, George Washington would still be alive today. So um, anyway, I love the, the, the idea that it's like he's, he's his own worst enemy, really. I mean, nothing I could tell, uh, talk about him uh, would uh, make him look worse than that. Anyway, uh, Dr. Thornton right here, and we're going to head right up here next. Now, um, generally, the, what, the other thing that's great about cemetery, uh, the, this cemetery is that we have everybody here from, from really, well, from people that helped uh, assassinate a president all the way up to people that were quite high in the uh, federal government. Um, our highest ranking person, in fact, is a vice president. That would be Elbridge Gary over here. Um, there was actually another, um, there was another uh, vice president here, George Clinton from New York, uh, but he was actually returned to the state of New York uh, in about 1900. But anyway, here we have Elbridge Gary. Um, now, once again, um, I'm not interested in what he did as vice president. Um, I'm actually much more interested in something that he did back when he was the, uh, the governor of Massachusetts. Um, so uh, he was told to um, uh, redraw the districts of Massachusetts. Um, redistricting has been a thing, well, it's, it's actually you know, in the Constitution, essentially, it says that you have to make sure that, uh, that everything is properly apportioned um, through the census, because of the census. And uh, he sort of was looking at where his supporters were living and where people who didn't support him were living. And so he drew actually some really odd-looking districts to kind of push all of his, uh, his opponents into one district and so that he could win all the other ones. Uh, you, of course, know what this is called today. Um, but um, a, um, a, a, a newspaper cartoonist at the time looked at one of these districts and said, you know, that kind of looks like a salamander. And so he called it the gerrymander um, in a cartoon that he drew. That word gerrymander, of course, today with a soft G rather than a hard G, and don't ask me why that change uh, is the word gerrymander, which continues to be the bane of our uh, political system today. But anyway, it's all this guy's fault right here. Um, and uh, interestingly enough, it doesn't actually say anything about that on his gravestone. I, I, I don't know why that is. Anyway, we're going to head this way. So um, another, um, another sort of group of, uh, of people buried here in the cemetery are actually Native Americans, which is, uh, which is kind of interesting. Um, uh, and the reason that they're here is almost invariably the same, namely that they came to uh, Washington to lobby the federal government for some reason or another. 
and while they were here, they died uh, for whatever reason. Um, usually, of course, you know, catching a, a disease that, that they uh, were not, had not been exposed to uh, back in, uh, in their home territories. Um, but uh, it's, it, it's, it's a story that, that comes up again and again. Probably the most uh, famous of those is a guy named Push Mateha, um, by, uh, who fought with Andrew Jackson and came here to Washington to lobby Jackson as president later, um, uh, unfortunately dying before he could do so. Um, however, he did, uh, his last request was that the big guns be fired over his grave, and uh, so that, uh, in fact, that's exactly what they did. Uh, Jackson did say that it was quite, uh, it was quite unfortunate uh, uh, that he had not heard about um, Pushmateha's uh, interest in talking to him before he died. But I'm going to talk about a different guy. It's right here. This is Utsin Malikin. And actually, the first thing that you'll notice about it is that it's actually a, um, th this is a government issue gravestone. If you go to um, Arlington Cemetery, they all kind of look just like this. Um, and, uh, and there are actually a number of graves that are the, where the Veterans Administration is responsible for uh, their graves here at Congressional Cemetery. Now, um, but the reason why I'm uh, intrigued by this is actually a relatively new gravestone. Um, right below it here is the original one. You can see it's kind of chewed up. And so um, members of uh, Utsin Malikin's family uh, sort of requested that, um, that he get a new uh, gravestone. Um, and so that's, uh, that's exactly what this is. Um, so this was said a few years ago, and members of uh, his family were here for it, for that event. I, um, I, I, I was lucky enough to be able to stop by and, and be part of the ceremony and, and hear uh, the family. The, my favorite part of it um, was where the, the fam two members of his family to, um, were talking about what happened to him here in Washington, D.C. And I forgot what exactly the order was and who had which uh, theory, but the way it worked was the one person gets up and says, yeah, you know what? So Utsin Malkin came here to Washington, D.C. to lobby the federal government or to renegotiate a treaty. And um, he, uh, was, uh, he died of, um, of some disease, probably cholera. That seemed to be the usual uh, way to go. My, my sister will tell you something completely different, but that's, that, that's what happened. And then she gets up and says, oh, well, you know, actually what happened is that he was thrown out of a window. Again, you know, my brother doesn't agree, but, you know, whatever. Um, that, so so it's, to me, it's like I, I just kind of like this idea that it doesn't really matter. I mean, I, I spend way too much time worrying about, well, how did this person die when the really the interesting question is like that he did die that that, well, that this happened that uh, you know this is uh, he was trying to do the right thing by his tribe he was one of the elders there trying to renegotiate this treaty to try to hold the United States government to their um, uh, to, to what they uh, their promises and unfortunately died along the way um, so, uh, so, so so that actually gave me a, a, a sort of a uh, it's an interesting perspective and an important one in uh, in when researching uh, topics. So anyway, that's why I like talking about with Samalikin, and uh, I think uh, it's a, it's a, it's a great. I'm really glad that they put up this new uh, gravestone here, um, so that hopefully his story will be remembered. All right, we're gonna head over this way. I'm gonna go this way if you want to go that way. So. Um, some of the uh, some of the people here in um, in Congressional Cemetery are almost uh, caricatures of themselves, and um, uh, well, let me start this way. Um, I gave this tour um, basically as a history tour. Uh, one of the last tours I gave before uh, everything shut down in D.C. Arlington Cemetery had shut down, um, so I called up uh, the cemetery and said, help, I got 50 kids, I don't know what to do with them, can I take them to the cemetery for an hour? And they're like, of course. Well, it got a little difficult when I got here um, because I realized that the appropriate way to describe our next person here is hooker with a heart of gold. And I realized that, well, maybe that's not completely appropriate phrasing for uh, a, a group of eighth graders. And in fact, I'm not quite sure what the uh, appropriate phrasing would be. 
Um, but anyway, um, and Marianne Hall here was uh, ran probably the most um, uh, the the best house in Washington DC during the Civil War um, it's uh, it was located where today the uh, National Museum of the American Indian is located and before that was built they actually uh, did an archaeological excavation of the grounds and they discovered the remains of her house and more, more importantly the remains of her garbage pit in that pit they found um, turtle shells and um, and bottles, uh, champagne bottles, indicating sort of the quality of the food that uh, uh, Ms. Hall was um, was was giving her uh, guests there. So, um, uh, she uh, her her establishment was never busted. Uh, they wouldn't have they uh, would have been problematical with the number of generals and whatnot that they would have swept up in that. So. Um, she uh, she did very very well for herself, um, but she as I said earlier she really did have a heart of gold. Um, I found a, uh, a newspaper article about her. Well, it was actually about a young woman who was in her line of business who killed herself. Um, came to a very very tragic end. Uh, Marianne Hall uh, was uh, then uh, stepped in to pay for proper uh, burial. I've actually kind of looked to see where that is. I, I don't actually know. I never, was never able to find out where she was actually interred. Um, and uh, even more importantly, it wasn't just sort of a one-off, but actually after she retired, she turned her house into kind of a woman's home. And uh, uh, women that were trying to, you know, better themselves or get away from abusive relationship or whatever, uh, knew that they could come there uh, for a, a safe place. Um, so that's why, um, in spite of her sort of shady background, uh, it's, it's not wrong the um, the uh, statues that um, are on top of her grave that's actually her um, she's over there on the right and then it's her mother and uh, sister uh, that uh, that are uh, next to her here um, but uh, yeah she uh, she certainly did change uh, her uh, her ways and uh, it's it's definitely uh, appropriate it's also kind of amazing how big it is um, and uh, when you think about, well, where that all came from. Anyway, so uh, Marianne Hall uh, was uh, definitely um, redeemed herself, uh, certainly, and, uh, and deserves uh, this kind of uh, spot here in the cemetery. It looks like the rain really has passed now, so I can go back to waving around with my devil's toothpick here instead of using it. And uh, our next stop, I mean, I could probably spend an hour talking about um, this, uh, the scandals um, and legends that have grown up around this man. But um, he was uh, really a uh, Capitol Hill um, born and bred. Um, his, uh, he was born in a house. If you're on Seward Square, there's today on the south side, there's a church. If you look to the uh, to the west of the church, there's kind of an overhang. Right underneath that was the house where J. Edgar Hoover was born, and um, he uh, he lived on Capitol Hill until his mother died in 1931. Um, his first job was actually running errands at Congressional <laughs> at Eastern Market. Um, Well, it's, it's only one helicopter, so we don't have to wave. Um, I'm gonna just let this helicopter go by. Uh, one of the, let me, let me, let me check the time while, while, while I'm waiting here. Oh, wow, uh, okay, no, we're, we're, we're Perfect on time. Okay, good. Lots more stories to tell. All right, so J. Edgar Hoover here, uh, born on Capitol Hill. He uh, ran errands at Eastern Market. Um, at that time, he also picked up um, a, uh, a, his nickname. Um, uh, although people disagree. I mean, they, e they say it's either Speed or Speedo. 
um, neither of which would really be very appropriate nicknames today. But um, and people also can't agree why he got that. Was it because he was so speedy about running his errands, or the speed with which he spoke? We don't really know. But anyway, so Speedo uh, um, uh, Hoover here. Um, he uh, then. Uh, went to Columbian College today at George Washington University um, and uh, during that time he actually worked at the Library of Congress uh, and learned actually a lot about organization of data something that was very important in what he did later. Um, then uh, he uh, once he graduated a law degree um, this was right during the um, uh, during the First World War um, and by this time his father had died so he was the sole support for his mother so he uh, was looking for a job uh, that would not end up with him being shipped over to uh, the war um, so he actually joined uh, the Department of Justice and was put in part in charge of the Bureau of Investigation which of course evolved into the Federal Bureau of Inves Investigation later. Um, back then the, it was kind of a disorganized group uh, not very well regarded he did do a lot uh, to professionalize it, but um, he was also in charge of it for, what, 50 years or something like that, um, and this kind of power, well, corrupts, right? Um, and uh, as I said, he lived here until 1931. Uh, then he moved to somewhere northwest, uh, but after he died, he was brought back here to, uh, to well, the family plot, actually. His, his father and mother are buried here as well. Now, as far as the scandals and the urban legends of them, as I said, this I could go on for a long time, but um, I think uh, sort of overarching for me, uh, sort of the way he put this, uh, uh, was that uh, back, you know, when McCarthyism was a thing, um, he was quite offended by the fact that people called it McCarthyism. He felt that if people really understood who was really driving this fight against communism in this country, they would call it Hooverism rather than McCarthyism. And of course, his uh, urge in this direction took uh, all sorts of turns. Um, the whole COINTEL Pro of the uh, 60s and 70s, when it came out, the kind of uh, ways that he was spying on U.S. citizens really has changed people's uh, opinions about him. He was one thing that he was really good at was to uh, get his name into newspapers. And whenever the FBI um, solved the case, it was J. Edgar Hoover who had solved it, uh, and he would sort of jump in front of the cameras and and take any credit that he possibly could. Uh, and and for a long time, people believed that later that became, uh, people have certainly reassessed um, their opinion of him. Now, the one uh, big legend of, of about him, of course, is that he was a cross-dresser, that he was is, um, gay or something like that. Um, that's almost certainly not true. Um, in fact, the only source for this cross-dressing legend is, in fact, a book written by a woman who's sort of a no notorious fabulist. She claims to have seen it one time, um, and uh, I think that, that's, that that can be entirely discounted. Um, so, um, so just because, uh, you know, people have reassessed their thinking about Jay Groover is not a reason to sort of wholesale believe anything bad about the man. Um, however, continuing on down this way, there's sort of an interesting sidelight to his, uh, his history. Um, his, uh, his second in command at the, at the White House, a guy named Clyde Tolson, um, was, uh, he was sort of pulled out of obscurity by, uh, by uh, Hoover and made the second in command. Um, in fact, after Hoover died, uh, Tolson said, no way do I want to be the head of the FBI. Um, and um, by the way, that, that caused the question to be open, who would be it? A guy named Mark Felt felt that he should be it. He was passed over for it, and that's why he became Deep Throat. But that's a whole different story. Um, Clyde Tolson, when he died a few years after uh, Hoover, was buried right here. This is about as close as you could have gotten to the, uh, to the, um, to the grave of Hoover, because of course all these other graves have been built since the Hoover grave had been, uh, had been put in many, many years earlier. So, um, and in fact, uh, Tolson spent much of his life as close as he could to Hoover. Um, he would be picked up by Hoover's driver every morning. They would pick up Hoover, drive to the FBI building together. They would go out for lunch together, and then uh, in the evening, the same thing in reverse. The driver would take uh, Hoover home and then finally drop off Tolson. They went on vacation together. They did everything together. Now, 
people, of course, have made all sorts of assumptions about what that means, about the relationship between the two. Again, I don't believe that there's anything uh, behind that. Um, all I will say is that it is kind of amusing that uh, this, the area where Tolson is buried is called Gay Corner. Um, this is where Leonard Matlovich is buried. Um, another helicopter, sorry. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Well, as long as it's not hovering right above us, uh, I'll be okay with that. Anyway, so um, so anyway, so 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 the gay corner. Um, there's a number of gay lesbians that have uh, are either buried here or are planned to be buried here. Um, and uh, congressional is actually very uh, welcoming there, uh, which is one of the reasons why this this started. Is that for many of them, uh, there were other no, no other cemetery would allow them to be. Uh, as open about it um, and so uh, that congressional has always been very progressive in that regard but there's no real scandal there so I'm gonna keep right on going all right now the next uh, we're gonna stop very briefly here um, it's uh, one of the newer um, uh, of the um, gravestones here in Congressional Cemetery um, and one of the more famous people here in Washington, D.C. as well. It's Marion Barry. Um, Marion Barry, uh, he spent a fair bit of time here at Congressional Cemetery, um, not necessarily um, uh, visiting graves or anything. I'll leave it at that. Um, but here we go, uh, his gravestone mayor for life here. Um, it's, uh, it's pretty fitting to uh, this guy. But as I said, that's not really what I want to talk about. Again, uh, his scandals are legion, um, but uh, I really want to talk about another uh, person here. This is sort of along with uh, John Quincy Adams, sort of my favorite person here in the cemetery. It's Anne Royale. Um, now, Anne Royale has an amazing story. She was born in, you know, the western frontier, i.e. somewhere like Kentucky or something like that, in 18, uh, 1769, so, you know, before the revolution. Um, and she, um, uh, she married fairly young, a wealthy man, older man, um, which sort of, you know, uh, had her set for life. Um, and uh, in fact, when that, uh, that husband died relatively um, early on, um, you know, really looked, she really looked like she had it made. Unfortunately, the family of her husband um, challenged the will of, uh, of, of, uh, that he had written, and they won. And so uh, Ms. Royale suddenly found herself entirely destitute. Um, but she was a smart woman. Um, she figured that um, people were interested in this country. Um, you know, they may have known their own state or, you know, that sort of thing, but there were a lot of other states that people didn't know. And of course, back then, the differences between the states were even greater than today. So um, and traveling was not easy. Um, this is around 1800 now. And um, so what she did is she would travel around and write these so-called black books about various areas, uh, the various states of the Union. They were very popular. They gave people much better sense of, oh, what the, the, the differences within the country, what binds us together, all these things um, that, that were really important in these, in these early days. Um, she eventually settled down in Washington, uh, actually lived pretty close to the capital, and started writing newspapers. Um, uh, one of them was called Paul Pry, and uh, they were kind of scandal rags. I mean, there, were, there was real reporting that she did. In fact, she was supposedly the first person to use interview as a, as a method of gathering information for newspapers. Um, but, uh, but she had her slightly shady ways, too. Um, and the one, uh, she would basically get everybody who was anybody in the city to buy her newspaper. And they would, because if they didn't uh, buy a subscription to her paper, she'd write mean things about them in the newspaper. So, um, scurrilous. Let's, let's go with scurrilous. Um, so, so people, she was kind of feared. 
um, and uh, uh, but uh, she was she, she was she was quite you know as I said she had to fight for herself she did what she could now there's two stories actually about Miss Royale that I like to tell one true one false um, you'll probably be able to guess which is which so the first uh, story is that she was a um, as I said, she lived near the, the capital, and there was a Presbyterian church nearby, and somehow she got into a beef with them. Um, and uh, she would write sort of rude things about the church in her, uh, in her newspaper, uh, gave, the, gave the various vocal members of that group uh, rude names. Um, it was pretty funny, actually. But they, of course, did not like this. So they would uh, then go stand in front of her house and pray really loudly. So, of course, then she would retaliate with whatever, uh, whatever means she had. Um, eventually, the uh, members of the church uh, convinced the powers that be to uh, arrest Ms. Royale and to charge her. Um, she was charged actually with a multiple uh, of uh, different um, uh, charges, but the only one that actually stuck was uh, that of being a common scold. Now, common scold, that's kind of a leftover from, you know, I don't know, middle-aged England, right? And the only reason why it was, a, uh, it was even on the books as a, as a tort here in Washington, D.C. was because it had been taken over from the Maryland uh, laws in 1800 when, when they had created the laws for the District of Columbia. They just kind of taken over wholesale that, and then kind of, you know, tweaked around the edges there. But this, you know, common school was still on the books. The problem came when, it, uh, when they wanted to actually punish her for this, because it turned out that the punishment was a ducking. Literally, you take, uh, you build a ducking chair, you put the person here, you duck them in the water a couple of times. Um, the people at the Navy Yard went far as far as to build a model of a ducking chair to like show the judge um, before the judge said, you know what, this is ridiculous. I'm, I'm fining you $10 and go about your business. And friends of hers so, uh, paid the $10 and that was that. So that's one story. The other story is I mentioned earlier that she got a lot of her information through interviews. Uh, and um, she would get those interviews in any way that she could. So one of the, uh, uh, one of the people she really wanted to uh, interview was John Quincy Adams. And she knew that Adams um, came, uh, went, liked to go swimming in the Potomac uh, every morning. Now, back then, he didn't have things like swimsuits, so he would just chuck it all and hop into the river. So, Ms. Royale came and sat on his clothing while he was out swimming. When he returned to shore, she uh, uh, wanted to get out, but not when there was a woman present. She said, I'm not leaving here until you promise to give me an interview. And so, John Quincy Adams had to say, all right, fine, I'll give you an interview, come back to the White House, and, and, and we'll do it, but please let me put my clothes on right now. And so that's how it worked. Now, you might well guess it, that latter story, which is not actually true. Um, in fact, um, if you read her books, uh, she had apparently a very good relationship with Adams. She visited him up in Massachusetts and, and chatted with him. Um, there, was, there did not seem to be any sort of uh, enmity too. But I do kind of love the idea of this, again, this clever way of getting what you want. So um, how, how are we doing on time here? We got about 10 minutes left. Perfect. We're going to head over this way. And yeah, this, uh, this, this, this next story um, is... Uh, I really kind of enjoy it. Uh, a lot of people got involved in it over the years to, uh, uh, to figure it out. Um, and we had the Smithsonian Institution uh, involved. And, uh, and it also, it's, it's about one of my favorite uh, scandals, which is grave robbing. Um, there was grave robbing here at um, Congressional Cemetery. But not so much here, really. The the much much more likely there was another um, uh, Popper's field that was a little bit north of us here uh, for many years, and that was actually where these things were, tended to happen. In fact, probably the most famous uh, story about that um, 
a guy named Bo Hickman, who is actually buried uh, in Congressional Cemetery. He's kind of a man about time, ne'er do well. Um, when he died, he had no money, and so he was quickly buried in a pauper's field. However, friends of his, when they discovered that Hickman had died, um, they uh, went rushing out to, uh, to, to reclaim the body, to give him a proper burial. Unfortunately, by the time they got there, um, the, uh, the resurrectionists, as they were called back then, had been uh, at it already um, and uh, hadn't done a very good job of it. Um, and so parts of uh, and Mr. Hickman were kind of lying around. So anyway, the friends gathered up the parts, uh, buried him in Congressional Cemetery over that way so um but uh but yeah bo hickman kind of a kind of an amazing uh story and in life as well as in death but right here uh, we have another similar story william wirt now william wirt was a uh, uh attorney general this is really kind of boring i mean who cares right died in 1834 um the story actually doesn't really become interesting until not that long ago, um, when uh, people were um, were going through um, uh, Jim Graham's office, uh, the ex um, um, the, the ex uh, council member, and discovered a box that said William Wirt on it, sort of metal, kind of beat up metal box, it said William Wirt on it. And when they opened it up, they found in it a skull. Um, so they were like, hmm, I wonder who this William Wirt might be. And they did a little research and they said, oh, wait, maybe that's the William Wirt that's buried at Congressional. So they contacted the cemetery and said, hey, we have what may be one of your, one of your people's uh, heads here. Um, so they went in um, through the door here um, and, uh, and checked. And no, the, the body is complete there. Um, but... Um, but then they, they, they did eventually send the box over and they started to do the research and this is where the Smithsonian gets involved. They actually had one of their bone people come out and examine all that and discovered that yes indeed the, the head that was on William Wirt's body in here was not his at all, rather the skull in that box was his. So that all got straightened out again and then they put this big hunk of uh, granite in front of the door so that uh, nobody, could, um, nobody could open it. Now, how that originally happened, um, we don't know. We're pretty sure that somebody else had found it in a in one of their um, relatives' houses uh, when they were uh, taking that, uh, removing everything from that after that person's death. Um, and they're like, we don't know what to do with it. Oh, we'll just give it to our council member. And then it kind of got lost there. So um, so the, the story kind of runs uh, completely dry right there. We don't know who it was um, that, that was responsible here. Certainly, um, there were times in the middle of the, uh, of the century, the 20th century, where uh, things were not as nice uh, at Congressional Cemetery as they are today. Um, it's been uh, even just the 15 years that I've lived on Capitol Hill and come here, the improvement has been dramatic. Um, and uh, so, so I assume that somewhere along the line there, somebody realized that they could get in here and grab that, uh, that, that skull. Now, why they went to the trouble of actually, you know, getting a box and painting William Works on it, I don't know. Um, but uh, that, that, that's one of those things that we'll have to... Uh, uh, be, you know, we'll just have to let be. But I have to say that at least Mr. Wirt is, you know, kind of all back together again in here and hopefully will remain in peace here uh, from now on. We have time to go over to, uh, to Susa, right? Mm -hmm. yeah, perfect. Yeah, also, I want to get away from, uh, from the jail that's over here because they are going to test their siren in about two minutes? Uh, three. three minutes. So uh, I'll try to get away from that before that goes off. That's also a very DC way of being interrupted here, I guess. Um, it's, it's good when we're giving the tours here um, is to, uh, we know that when that siren goes off, it's time to wrap it up. So uh, and we're going around the, uh, uh, on the altar there uh, during the service itself and then uh, back out through there.
uh, decided that he wanted to join the circus. His mother did not uh, like this idea, so she dragged him, and I like to think that it was sort of like by the ear, you know, um, over the block to barracks uh, and signed him up to be um, uh, in the Marine Band. Um, and he, uh, he was really, um, he became sort of the, the, the face of the, the Marine Band. In fact, he was the head of it for 12 years here. And um, uh, he actually quit being the, uh, leading the band because he could make more money uh, as a private citizen. Um, but he did return during the First World War um, to, to lead them once again. So he, he never really, he never really uh, left the Marine, uh, the Marine Band either way. But he, he really was the one that made that president's own band a, a world class um, and play here. Uh, uh, during the 50s and 60s, say it would often be quite alone here. Um, and, uh, but today, uh, it, it's part, a very important part of the Congressional Cemetery calendar. It's usually sort of the last part. That. But there is an urban legend that, in fact, Sousa himself kind of uh, worked up. Now, uh, after he had left the Marine Band, to sort of connect with the well, you completely make things up about his um, about his background and. Uh, um, that's uh, and that's uh, that pretty much um, ends the tour. There's so many other stories that I'd love to tell, but it's actually starting to rain again a little bit here. Um, but um, come on out at um, whenever or watch on uh, on Facebook. Uh, we're going to keep giving tours like this. Uh, I actually. Gave